Um, okay, so I'm John Quarterman. I'm the Swanee Riverkeeper. That's what it says there on the hat. I hope it's accurate. And uh, I do advocacy, trying to keep the waters clean in the 10,000 square miles of the Swanee River Basin in Georgia and Florida, including uh, the most populous city in the basin is Valdosta, Georgia, believe it or not. Second most populous is Tifton, and then it quickly goes to, depends on how you count it, half in or half not, but uh, Live Oak's in there, for example, Jasper, all sorts of places in Florida. I spend half my time in Florida, half my time in Georgia, and a lot of time paddling a keyboard. Sarah J. Jones, our board president, is here. And we got some of our usual suspects. And um, who we have to talk today about the seems like never-ending issue of a proposed strip mine near the Okefenokee Swamp. Uh, I first heard about this in early 2019. I believe they first contacted St. Mary's Riverkeeper slightly before that. And um, Emily is going to tell us all about it. Emily Floor is the St. Mary's Riverkeeper. And I have to say that uh, while um, uh, uh, me, uh, Sewanee Riverkeeper and our parent organization, Walls Watershed Coalition, we do what we can regarding the mine and the small. For example, I think we've now gotten uh, seven county or city resolutions supporting the swamp against the mine, including one in Florida. And we lobby the legislature and such things. But the, the mine site is in the St. Mary's Riverkeeper Basin. And I am thrilled to see that the current St. Mary's Riverkeeper is extremely active in opposing that mine. So okay. without further ado, please, Emily Floor, St. Mary's Riverkeeper, please tell us all about it. Great. Thanks, John. Thanks, everyone, for having me today. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity um, to talk about um, the St. Mary's River and our watershed as a, as a whole. Um, and so we'll, uh, I'm sure much of this will be repetitive for you guys because, um, you know, we are a river keeper, just like, uh, the Swanee river keeper. So we have a lot of the same charges for protecting our waterways, but we all are, have the ability to approach protecting our waterways in whatever manner best fits the communities we serve and the river that we serve. Um, so we are a 501c3 a nonprofit organization, just like the Swanee Riverkeeper is, um, charged with protecting and enriching the St. Mary's River. We do this through our water quality monitoring program, education and outreach. Um, and what's really great about the Riverkeeper Waterkeeper program is that we are an independent voice. So we are not a state agency. Um, our board is not dictated by who is in charge uh, at the legislation, at the, at the Capitol. So um, we're able to do what we need to do in order to protect um, our waterways and hold those uh, state agencies' feet to the fire uh, when it comes to protecting those waterways. We also are, um, our finances are based on the donations from concerned citizens within the watershed, but we're also able to go after uh, grants to be able to do what we need to do. Um, also along the same lines as the Swanee River Keeper, we both, both of us work in both states, uh, which I call it a blessing and a curse because it's a curse because I have to keep up, we have to keep up with two states. The blessing is that um, we actually have impact in two states for protecting our waterways. Um, so it is a lot of work. Um, we are a part of uh, Georgia Water Coalition, so a, a coalition of organizations in the state of Georgia, uh, specifically looking at protecting all waterways in the state of Georgia. These are not just the Riverkeeper organizations, but also paddling groups, uh, communities uh, groups, um, interfaith groups, uh, just a wide variety of um, really active environmental uh, concerned citizens. Um, we're also part of Waterkeepers Florida. Florida has a lot of the same issues across the state, whereas Georgia, there's a very diverse amount of issues because you have the mountains all the way to the coast. Florida's pretty flat, so we all have a lot of the same issues, except for John and I, who uh, tend to be the odd ducks uh, on some of the 
the massive statewide issues that happen. However, we do lend our support um, to our fellow waterkeepers in the state. Um, and then all of the waterkeepers are under this umbrella organization of Waterkeeper Alliance, which is an international uh, organization uh, protecting millions and millions of square miles of waterways around the world. Um, so our priorities as St. Mary's River Keeper is our water quality, promoting low impact development, especially those along waterways um, and waterfronts. Uh, also looking at our coast when we're talking about resiliency plans, uh, we want to ensure that our marshes are have room to migrate as waters begin to rise. Protecting Trail Ridge from industrial threats, so we will talk about that, one of those issues today. Um, enforcing the Clean Water Act to protect our waterways from effluent discharge, but also utilizing the Clean Water Act to um, help improve water quality areas, especially in low-income areas. Um, and then collaborating to promote a, a more resilient watershed. So to give you an idea of what uh, kind of what the St. Mary's looks like, because it is a pretty unique shape, um, it is 130 miles long. It's 1,600 square miles, um, uh, and it has about 160,000 residents within the watershed. Um, so I call it, it looks kind of like to me a square root value sign. If you remember back from high school math class, the square root value sign. Um, and that is because of Trail Ridge. Um, so Trail Ridge is this 100 mile long um, ancient barrier island uh, that held back the waters uh, five to 7,000 years ago, um, which is what trapped the water forming the Okefenokee Swamp. And then water finds the path of least resistance to the lowest uh, elevation, which is the ocean or the Gulf of Mexico in this case. And so about 80 to 85 percent of the water that pooled on the west side of Trail Ridge um, flowed to form the Suwannee River, and which empties out into the Gulf of Mexico. And then the southeastern quadrant, around 20 percent of the swamp pooled and formed the St. Mary's River. And so you can see the St. Mary's uh, has that uh, square root value sign. So it empties, um, comes out of the swamp in that southeastern corner. And I have a couple of pictures to show you what it looks like at various spots uh, to show how diverse it is. Um, so it flows south along the western side of Trail Ridge. And then it turns east as it travels through the only gap in that 100 mile Trail Ridge. Um, so it passes right through it. We actually do a paddle. Um, of this stretch, it's about 10 miles of a paddle section that we do. We call it paddle through Trail Ridge. And we put in at a park on the west side of Trail Ridge and we take out at a boat ramp on the east side of Trail Ridge. So you actually pass through the whole thing. Um, and then uh, it flows north for about 30 to 40 miles um, along the east side of Trail Ridge. And it flows that length for um, that large of a distance is because actually on the east side of the river, there's another smaller ridge system called the Penn Holloway Terrace. And that's what kind of creates like a valley. So the river kind of runs through a valley, um, you know, in Florida, what a valley looks like in Florida, um, all the way north until it meets the, um, the gap in the Penn Holloway Terrace, where it flows east at Folkestone, Georgia, Hilliard, Florida area, and heads out to the Atlantic Ocean um, through uh, Nassau County and Camden County. Um, and so, and then it empties at the Atlantic Ocean at Cumberland Island National Seashore. So the St. Mary's River is actually bookended by two national treasures, the Okefenokee Swamp um, and Cumberland Island National Seashore. Um, in 2022, two sections of the river in Georgia were designated as, as recreational. This just means that um, there's uh, higher water quality standards uh, for these stretches. And we are working on trying to get the rest of the river designated as recreational. And what, and, and John can probably attest to this, one of the um, most interesting things about working with a waterway that is in two states is that there are two different approaches to a water, the same waterway. So the St. Mary's River doesn't flow through, go through one and then flow through the other one like the Swanee does. It actually forms the border of Georgia and Florida uh, for 130 miles. So 40% of the waterway is um, in Georgia and 60% is in Florida. Um, so it actually is the border between the two states. Um, 
And so Georgia only considers two sections of the main stem St. Mary's to be recreational. Florida sees the entire river as recreational. So that's always a fun thing to have to have conversations about. Yeah, we got the same thing. The Wifikuchi yeah. and the Lapaha are not considered uh, navigable in Georgia, but they are in Florida. And uh, we did get them uh, mostly considered to be recreational in Georgia and Florida. And by default, they all are. And there you go. It's just a strange thing how it works with those political boundaries. Um, so what sets us, sets us apart from other river keepers? Again, we can all um, you know, approach our waterways, protecting our waterways, which in whichever way works best for the community um, and are the needs of the waterways. Obviously, there are some issues in the St. Mary's River watershed that you won't see in the Swanee and you won't see in other watersheds in either Georgia or Florida. Um, and so my organization's approach might be a little different than some of the other ones. Um, so we have an extensive water quality monitoring program, which I know most of the Georgia water keepers have, including uh, the Swanee River Keeper. We do river cleanups. It's one of the things we're, we're really known for river keepers are. Um, provides that direct impact to um, improving the health of your waterway. Experimental, experiential learning opportunities, paddle trips. We just started doing boat tours on the St. Mary's last year. Um, and we're hoping to have a series of, of trips from Oki to Ocean. Um, we were going to do it this year, but then EPD opened up public comment. So a lot of things had to get put on the back burner um, during this time frame. River enhancement projects. This has to do with resiliency pro projects. Um, and then advocacy and our engagement. So the reason why we're all here um, to learn about is the mining on Trail Ridge issue. Um, and so this is currently one of our biggest um, priorities is during the 60 day public comment period for the three draft permits is, is developing our public comment um, to try to make this permit, these permits as restrictive as possible so the mining company um, does not see a financial um, benefit to being able to do this and to throw enough wrenches in their system where EPD is like, you know what, there's too much environmental impact. We're not going to make this happen. We're not going to let this happen. So um, just to give you a visual of what it looks like. Um, so this is a, a, what's called a LIDAR map and it shows elevation. So the more red it is, the higher an elevation it is. And the more purple it is, the lower in elevation. So you can see the ocean plate uh, right here, that drop off. Um, and then right here is Trail Ridge. There's a little gap right here, which is the St. Mary's River flowing through it. So it does go through Georgia and into Florida. Um, so you may have heard of mining in Stark um, uh, for titanium dioxide and other parts in Florida. So there is mining on Trail Ridge currently on other sections of it. But what the biggest issue for this one is, is its proximity to the Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge. Um, so, and then there are other minings on other terraces and other ridge systems, um, such as the Penn Holloway Terrace up in the Satilla watershed, which is the watershed just north of us, uh, north of St. Mary's River. Um, and this gives you kind of like a cross-sectional view of the elevation that I was talking about. So you have the terrace uplands on the west side and then the Okefenokee Swamp, which is kind of like a basin. It's a bowl. Um, so Trail Ridge formed an ancient barrier island. And then when, when waters receded five to 7,000 years ago, it trapped that water, as I was talking about, forming this Okefenokee Swamp. And the water flowed um, out of it to find its slope path of least resistance. But you'll see that Trail Ridge is a little exaggerated. Um, it looks like it's really, really high. Um, but it's 50, you know, meters above sea level. And that's around 175 at most uh, feet um, above sea level. The swamp is around 90 feet above sea level. And you can see the St. Mary's is actually a really, um, is, a, is a low point because again, water flows downhill. Um, so this uh, is, gives a good visual. So the, the mining company's uh, name is Twin Pines. I'll probably just refer to it as the mining company, trying to give them as little publicity as possible. Um, so they are, this, this mining company is an Alabama-based mining company um, that has no experience in what's called greenfield mining. They've never excavated 
from start to finish a mining uh, process before. They've always done piecemeals of other mining companies' projects, including one in Florida where they um, have a floor, have a consent order against them for mishandling their tailings and actually polluting a waterway. Um, they also have other arms of their mining company. Um, so they have a renewable energy um, arm and they are actually under a consent order for air quality issues and, and fish kills uh, for burning railroad ties and the uh, community surrounding that company um, during COVID actually got the burning of railroad ties um, illegal in the state of Georgia during COVID, which was really impressive. So these citizen action groups uh, really do a lot in ensuring um, the protection of our, of our air and our water. So, um, but this map shows you that 20% of the Okefenokee Swamp, the headwaters of the St. Mary's um, and where the mine is positioned on Trail Ridge in relation to it. So Trail Ridge at its crest at the mine site is about 175 feet above elevation and it's a hydrologic divide. So think of just, you know, like a ridge system. So you have a peak um, at the very top. So when rain falls, it's going to flow to the west to the swamp and then to the east to the St. Mary's. But what is unique about this is that when the water flows to the west to the swamp, it's flowing to the section of the swamp that feeds the St. Mary's. So actually the St. Mary's River is gonna be impacted twice by this mine. Um, and they they own about 8,000 acres and their demonstration mine, which they're trying to demonstrate that they are not gonna have a negative impact on the environment. And they're gonna have a positive impact on the economy of the surrounding communities um, uh. and to avoid having to go through the feds and army corps for jurisdictional wetlands, they've reduced it down to about 582 acres, around 600 acres to, of the actual mine footprint. So this is another LIDAR map um, made by Dr. Rhett Jackson from the University of Georgia. He's a hydrologist there and one of the uh, biggest outspoken scientists um, questioning a lot of the modeling and the science from EPD and the uh, mining company. And so he generated this map. And again, orange, red is the higher elevation and purple is the lowest elevation. So you can see Trail Ridge here. You can see the creeks flowing through it. So the creeks that flow out of this mine site to the west side that flows into the Okefenokee, that creek is called River Styx. I think that's appropriately named. Um, just make sure you take your coins with you. Um, so if that flows uh, to the west to the Okefenokee, which then feeds the upper St. Mary's. And then you have Boone Creek, which flows to the east side um, to the St. Mary's. So that really just shows you um, how um, these creeks are really important in ensuring the health of our waterways. And if we were to um, show you what they are going to do, this is a four-year plan. Um, again, it's just a demonstration mine. Um, so in year one, they're going to, you know, have their section that they're going to drag line. And then in year two, year three, and year four. And um, you can see across the street on the east side, there's this additional site here. This is a processing mill plant that's a, now a part of it. This is an older um, map. I couldn't find one like this in their revised plan um, that looked like this, but they um, have now included this highway here as part of their permitting uh, process because they are actually going to be trucking water from the mine site all the way over here because they're not allowed um, to discharge any water and all the, the mining withdrawal is happening on the big footprint. So just four years um, for this demonstration one. And they're using experimental dragline techniques for a company that's never greenfield mined before and has a history of environmental issues. So trifecta there, I think. <laughs> um, so the mine site itself. So when we look at how water flows, so one of the most difficult things to describe and to visualize is groundwater, right? We can see surface water flowing, we can see where it's moving to, um, but it's really hard to see where groundwater is, is going. Um, so we have to run these models 
um, based on sample bore holes and, and, and stuff like that on, on what we can do. Um, and so the image on your left side of the screen is from their, is from the mine company's uh, mining land use plan. And so this is showing um, the groundwater, the surficial aquifer. So if you were to dig down, it's the, the water just below your feet. A lot of focus has recently happened uh, with the Florida aquifer, which is the deep water, the deep well water. Um, and we'll get to that in just a little bit. But I wanted to show you the groundwater of the surficial aquifer. So you dig down and you hit water, that's the surficial aquifer, it's the water table. And you'll notice that there are blue, dark blue arrows showing the flow. So you have a peak, water to the west is gonna flow to the west, water to the east is gonna flow to the east, and you will get some that actually goes through the ground and, and, and filters into the Florida aquifer. But that's very a small amount in this case because we have something called the Hawthorne confining layer, which makes it difficult for water to, to percolate through. Um, so it's not a recharge area. So the, the dark blue arrows show the direction of water flow, the mine sites at the very tippy top of that crest, the St. Mary's River is to the right, Okefenokee Swamp is to the left. And you'll notice that the water in the ground follows the contours of the land. So if you have an elevation change, the water is gonna follow that same change. And the lowest elevation is gonna be your waterways. Um, and so that's when you see water levels in your rivers going up and down. That's your water table. The St. Mary's River is what's called a gaining stream. It means that water from the ground is feeding the river. But when you have a lot of water withdrawal from the ground, you can actually reverse that. And the water will move from in the stream to in the ground. And you'll go from a gaining stream to a losing stream. That affects water flow, uh, which could result in some water quality issues. So one of the issues we have, and these are just a couple of our issues. There are many other ones that we have, but we have limited time and we're still building our public comment. Uh, but these are the ones that we have um, definitely identified and have thought through and have written about. Um, so one of the mining plans is to continuously pump out water from the excavated pit to maintain eight feet or less of water. And they're estimating that at max, that'll be about 1.1 million gallons a day that they have to pump out. So the mining pit is 500 feet long, it's 500 by 100, and it's 50 feet deep. So it's a 50 feet foot deep hole. And when you dig a hole, think of like when you go to the beach, right? You dig a hole and water is going to be filling into the hole. It's seeping into the hole. So when you dig a big hole like that, you have to, you're going to have the water that's already there. So you have to pump it out. And then you're going to have the water that continuously seeps into the pit. So you have to constantly be pumping water out. And that's what that uh, picture on the bottom shows. And so you have this dewatering of the pit. And instead of water flowing away from the ridge, as it should, it's actually going to redirect groundwater. So some of it will flow away from the ridge, but some of it will actually flow into the hole. And so that's where that seepage rate is coming in. And so you have const water constantly flowing into the hole and you have to constantly pump it out. And that's that 1.1 million gallons of water a day. This is not the Florida aquifer number, which is 1.44. We'll talk about that in a minute. So the concerns we have with that um, is it's going to, the reduction in water quantity to the Okefenokee, which feeds the St. Mary's and to the St. Mary's to the east. So this is going to reduce water flow, which can exacerbate saltwater intrusion into the St. Mary's River, especially during periods of drought. And I have a couple of pictures uh, later on to show you last year's abnormally drought year, dry year, um, and you'll see how dry it can get, and you can see how fast it can actually flood. Um, so a lot of the uh, issues addressed are for the Florida and not what's called the surficial aquifer, which is that groundwater directly below your feet. These are the two wells that we'll talk about in a minute for the Florida, which is the deep aquifer. So that's the concern we have with the seepage into the mine pit and the water withdrawal. 
Another concern is the Florida aquifer pumping. Now the St. Mary's and the swamp are not, they have a little bit of Florida aquifer um, input, but not much. It's mostly precipitation and tributary fed, uh, but there is some Florida aquifer uh, recharge that goes on. Um, and there's some feeding from the swamp and the river into the Florida aquifer. So this is an image that I took from their groundwater extraction permit application, which is one of the newest documents that was uploaded in February. Um, and it shows you these like blue circular look looking shapes. And so the Florida aquifer pumping for processing water, they are saying it's going to be a max of about 500 gallons per minute. That's what GPM stands for. And there's two of them. So there's two pumps that they're going to be putting down into the Florida aquifer. And so these blue circles that you see in the image is the is what they have stated is their predicted drawdown of the Florida aquifer. What is interesting about it is that they are just showing their project study area. So these are the concentric circles. These should be full circles. So what is the impacts of the drawdown of the Florida aquifer going to have, not just on their 8,000 acres of their proposed project study area in the Okefenokee Swamp, but the St. Mary's, the surrounding communities that all live off of well water, and does it reach into Florida? So it's an incomplete circle of impacts. They are just concerning themselves with their project area, which they own property for, that no one resides on. But what is that going to do to the city of, of the town of St. George and the people that live off of well water? So that's one nope. of our issues that we have. They're going to get sick. Or they won't have water. So, you know, you could have water quality contamination issues if there's, you know, runoff and there's a lot of legacy contaminants in Trail Ridge. You could have that. Thank you, Lisa, for making that point. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, during periods of dry, of dry times, sometimes these people's wells, whether they're deep or they're shallow from the surficial, their wells go dry. And so what's that going to do to being able to provide water yeah. for their family or you know, there's a concern for people that have cows that have to do their own hay making. So, you yeah, know, what's that going to do for their livelihood? They're not even aware of it, more than likely. So, actually, the people that brought this to my attention are the residents of St. George. Oh, this okay, is one good. of their this is one of their biggest concerns. And when I saw this map, okay. we're like, where's the rest of the circles? Where's the rest of the oh. circle? Where are the wells in St. George? How far out does that, and this is just after one year of pumping. They do it after year two, after three, after four, and then one year post mining. So and there are five the, other maps like this. And what about the Cherokee of Georgia site, which is between St. George and the mine site? Correct. So this is something that I think has been um, not being discussed um, when it comes to the Florida and aquifer. A lot of the focus, of course, is coming from the feds stepping in to, to you know, uh, their jurisdiction of the federal waters of the Okefenokee Swamp. But this water withdrawal from the Florida and the surficial can impact the public health of the surrounding communities. And depending mm -hmm. on how far, how large those circles are, would it, can it reach into Baker and Nassau County, Florida's? So that's something we want answers to. And the community wants answers to. Yeah. But Lisa, thank you for making that point because I think that's a that's a really good question to ask. And if you're planning on submitting yeah. a public comment, please please add that in there. Um, the other issue we have is the evaporations. So the mining company is not allowed to discharge they um, into any of the water bodies. Um, so they have to do something with all the water that they're pumping out of the pit and they're pulling from the Florida aquifer. Um, so they came up with this idea, pretty sure someone just drew it on a napkin saying, why don't we try this? And they came up with this evaporator system. And so these are actually the updated evaporators. 
They had one last year, a plan last year from a company in the and Georgia EPD got so much pushback and questions about the um, the salt deposition, the saline cloud, uh, the clogging from all the other minerals that could get stuck in it. Um, you know, the aerosolization of all of those things into the surrounding communities that EPD asked them to change their evaporator system. So they came up with a new one. I don't know if anybody's a Star Trek fan, but when you look at these, these visuals, they look like uh, something that the Borg would live in. So, or, or they're Lego blocks. <laughs> like they're just these huge square black boxes <laughs> floating on these ponds to me it reminded me of the board um but they are gonna uh calibrate these to uh evaporate 1.4 million gallons of water a day out of the four management ponds they have eight ponds total eight four of them are for processing and four of them are for the the pumping out storing of the pump out water from the mine pit and then they're going to evaporate them out so this is a continuous consumptive use of groundwater, but it is a net loss of the water budget of the region. So you're pumping out from the ground and then you're releasing it into the atmosphere. There's nothing coming in. So think about your bank account, right? You're constantly taking out of your bank account. Nothing's going in. What's going to happen? You're going to run out of money and your, your collectors are going to come calling. So there's nothing going back into the system and we're not, we don't want a discharge permit. I'm not, I'm not advocating for that, but it does show that there is just a net loss to the water budget. And for EPD to claim that there's not going to be a significant impact to water levels and water flows and water quantity doesn't make any sense. So we're questioning yeah. their modeling technique for um, this consumptive use with no recharge outside of the precipitation. Um, so if you release all this out and you don't add anything back into the system, this could result in water, water quantity issues, again, with water flow, water level. It can also alter, alter water quality. With less water flowing downhill and into the river, the water levels in the, in the river could actually be lower more frequently. And that could increase temperature of the river, which would reduce dissolved oxygen of the river, which can impact wildlife and fish. And with less water flowing from upriver, you have less of a push to keep salt water at bay. So if you don't have as much water pushing the salt water to, into the ocean, it's gonna move upriver. And with sea level rise, it's just gonna go faster and faster and move further and further upriver. So this is an image taken last year, November of 2023. So not too long ago. This is me. <coughs> Michael, you may you might recognize this because you've been on our paddle trip here. This is one of our kayak launches for our paddle through Trail Ridge on the west side of Trail Ridge. So November of last year, I actually walked across at our kayak launch, the river. I've never been able to do that. I was with, uh, so I'm walking to Georgia right now. That's what I'm doing. I'm in Florida and I'm walking to Georgia. So I was actually with a group of people from Florida and a, lot, a couple of locals, and they were saying that they hadn't seen the river this low in eight years. Um, <clears throat> and so I'm walking across. And just to show you how flashy the water is, I know the Swanee can be pretty flashy when you have a lot of water at a very uh, short amount of time. The water levels rise really fast. Um, and so this was November 15th of 2023. We had a lot of rain in the area over Thanksgiving. So two weeks later, it's almost up over the bank. So the tree, let me just show you. This tree here, obviously we couldn't get that low this time, is right here on the cross of the bank. So now it's almost underwater. And then a couple of days later, like five days later, it's even higher. So within three weeks, this river went from, I can walk across it, so it's almost up over the banks. So it happens really fast. And you can watch it in the water level gauges. You'll see one get really high and then the other one will be low. And then a couple of days later, they switch. One's really low and the other one's really high. So it's almost like a wave of water you can see moving down. So um, in a very short amount of time, it can get, it can get very high. 
Um, but how much more frequent is it going to be like this? Where it's not zero flow, but it's really low flow and you're able to walk across the sandbars. Yeah. One of our biggest concerns about the water flow and water levels of the river is because we have Atlantic sturgeon. <clears throat> and seven-eighths of the river are considered critical habitat. Um, and so this is a sturgeon, a juvenile sturgeon that um, I was on a, a trip with the Fish and Wildlife Service on their annual sampling um, trip. And we caught a two-year-old Atlantic sturgeon. Um, up until about 2014, we thought Atlantic sturgeon were extirpated from the St. Mary's River, which means they no longer are there. Um, in 2014, researchers from the University of Georgia were on the river sampling because they did it every three years just to check. Um, and they caught a sturgeon. They caught a one-year-old juvenile sturgeon. And what's really great about sturgeon, y'all may know it because y'all have golf sturgeon, um, is that they are home spawners. So just like turtles return to the same beach that they were born on, sturgeon go back to the same rivers that they were born in to spawn. So if you catch a one-year-old sturgeon in the river, you know it was born in that river. They are born in fresh water. The parents lay the eggs on hard substrates, mostly limestone outcroppings. And then within five to seven days, the eggs hatch. You have little baby sturgeons swimming around, getting preyed upon. They're growing big and strong. By the time they're one years old, they, they head to the estuary. And they live in the estuary from year one to year three. So they are not in the ocean yet. Once they hit about year three, year four, they head out to the ocean. So if you catch a one to three year old, you know it was born in that, in that river. And so this one was born in it. So that's how they confirmed and verified that the sturgeon are still spawning in the St. Mary's River, even though they hadn't been caught or seen in years, which was amazing. So the first year that I went out with Fish and Wildlife Service, we didn't catch any. We caught a lot of gar, a lot of gar. And then the second year we went, um, we, they, we, they caught two last year, and I just happened to be on the boat when they caught this one. Um, and so I started asking questions. So I was like, okay, well, where do they spawn? Well, we don't know. Okay, when do they spawn? Well, we don't know. Well, what's the population size? Well, we don't know. So there's no answers to any of these questions. And so St. Mary's Riverkeeper has reformed and re-energized the Sturgeon Study Committee, which is made up of state agencies, federal agencies, local organizations, NGOs, um, to study the critical habitat of the St. Mary's River for sturgeon. And so far, Fish and Wildlife Service has done a side sonar scan of over 100 miles of the St. Mary's. Um, Georgia EPD is completing their river survey of the, of the critical habitat to build these models, these water quality models, these hydrodynamic models um, to determine uh, water flow, water quality, um, um, water flow modeling um, to determine, you know, the critical habitat of it to get a better understanding of it. These have all been done in other rivers in Georgia, um, but not the St. Mary's. And so this is now being done. Um, and so we're just trying to understand the habitat as a whole um, and what needs to happen to ensure that this genetically distinct population of endangered Atlantic sturgeon um, are protected. And so what I mean by genetically distinct is that these are St. Mary's sturgeon. They're not Satilla. They're not Altamaha. They're not Savannah. These are genetically different from all of those. And we have no idea how many reproducing sturgeon, adult sturgeon there are of this genetic type, which is pretty wild to think about. And so when you're contemplating a large um permit like this, a large project such as the mine, and you don't have these answers to these questions, how can you issue the permits? Cool. So what was really cool is I put this picture up on our Facebook page after we caught it, and one of our supporters sent me the picture on the far left. These are uh, sturgeon caught 40, 50 years ago on the St. Mary's. 
and they're the length of a truck bed and there are two or three of them. Wow. So before the Endangered Species Act came in and protected and eventually protected all sturgeon species, um, you used to be able to catch them for their flesh, for caviar. Um, you know, we almost hunted them to extinction. And then, of course, we had development along waterways, which impacted water quality, water flows, salt water, all that kind of stuff. So we are concerned about the impacts of this mine on the critical habitat for the, um, for the continuation of the St. Mary's River sturgeon. But we got a good team of people working on studying the river um, to determine, to be able to answer those questions. Um, so what is the future of this? You know, we're in this proposed mine draft permit period right now. And to John's point, it is never ending. I've only been on the job for a little over two years and I know I'm exhausted from it. So kudos to those that have been a part of this since the beginning. Um, but what has happened is that this proposed mine is just the beginning. Um, they, you know, EPD will state that we can't look at the cumulative impacts because they haven't asked for permits for anything else. However, the mining company is now on record for saying that they will be seeking permits for future mining on their land. So their current permit boundary for this proposed mine, for this these permits, is 820 acres. Again, it expanded because it now includes a section of Highway 94 and the, the mill um, just east and across the street. The mining, sorry, that says Ming footprint. Mine footprint is uh, about 582 acres. But Twin Pines Minerals, the mining company, owns 8,000 acres. So they're slowly buying up land north of them. And so this is um, a, a map that actually, I think John helped me figure out how to find um, is, uh, in Q Public is to figure out what properties does the mining company currently own. Um, and this is from last year, so it may be a little outdated. I don't know if they started buying up more land or anything, um, but I've roughly sketched out just to pop it out a little bit more uh, of the yellow of how much land they actually own. Um, and so it actually moves closer to the swamp uh, within a few hundred feet of the swamp. Now you'll hear the difference between they'll say, oh, we are, we're three miles from the, from the wildlife refuge. Well, they're actually like two and a half miles from the swamp because most, the wildlife refuge encompasses most of, uh, most of the swamp, but not all of it. So when they say like, oh, we're only going to come in within a mile of the wildlife refuge, it's really like, okay, but how close are you getting to the swamp outside of the refuge boundary? So they get really close within a few hundred feet of the swamp boundary. Um, and so they are, they have publicly said that they are going to mine the rest of it. And so this is, I don't, I'm, I'm terrible with phrases, the camel's nose under the under the tent, whatever that phrase is, you know, they're getting their foot in the door. Um, and so if they get this issued, um, you know, it might be easier for them to be able to get the next permit and then the next permit and then the next permit. So this is just the beginning. So one of the things that, you know, this was, um, I created this slide a few, a few weeks ago for another presentation when we were still in legislative session Legislative session is only up for a couple more days, and we've already gone over crossover day. Uh, but House Bill 71, um, Okefenokee Protection Act, um, was to protect, was generated to protect Trail Ridge from mining. Um, so this was just the information if people wanted to contact Speaker Burns. It's not going to get a committee hearing at this point. Um, most bills at this point, legislative session, uh, have already been decided. You, you can have last day signings from the governor like we did last year for fishing rights on waterways, um, but we are not, uh, we're not confident because it didn't even, House Bill 71 didn't even get a, a committee hearing this year. Um, so we don't think it's going to pass this year, but there may be a new version next year. Um, so just keep your uh, eyes on that, put pressure on your local representatives um, to sign on to that and to get that into committee. Um, support your local river keeper. Um, you know, y'all already are probably uh, supporting the Swanee River Keeper. As that mining moves north, it will start working its way into the section of the swamp that feeds the Swanee River. So it'll always impact the St. Mary's, 
but eventually it will move into the Suwannee watershed as well. Um, so we want to kind of stop it in its tracks so it doesn't get to that point and start impacting uh, two watersheds. Um, contact your elected officials and write to Georgia EPD during this comment period. Um, share your love and engage in the fight. Um, uh, you know, in, in supporting your local riverkeeper really helps with that. It allows us to do what we do. Get out and learn about the issue. Learn about the waterways. Um, experience it. Um, uh, host a letter writing party. Somebody did that one last year for a public comment, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, we created the lunch and learns last year to kind of help with the education process. So I'm, it's, and I took it from another river keeper. So I like how we're all kind of sharing ideas of how to get information out about our, our watershed and our issues. Um, and be the change. Every drop and every action counts. Um, the smallest little, uh, action can make the biggest difference. And I just wanted to thank y'all for your time and provide enough opportunity for questions. Oh, thank you. I want to know, is there some kind of way we could print out those things and hand them out to people so they could write letters and mail them in? Um, yeah, so the the recommendation, um, so sign-on letters are great. St. Mary's Riverkeeper is not generating a sign-on letter. Um, the reason for that is if you sign on to like a petition or a sign-on letter, it's great. It gets submitted in. But EPD is only going to count that as one public comment, even if you have 100 people signing it. Uh, so we okay. are encouraging everybody to write their own, which is why these lunch and learns are so great that John's putting on, is that it gives an opportunity to be like, okay, Lisa, you clearly are concerned about the health of the community surrounding it. Now you have a little piece of information that you can write a letter specific to that issue Whereas well, I'm gonna write a somebody on else on the, so somebody else on the call will maybe be like, oh, wait, the Florida aquifer is my concern. So now we're spreading the oh, concern okay. out and we're getting more comments submitted um, across a diverse uh, array of, um, yeah, of issues. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So then you want the numbers. You could have 500 people signing and it only counts as one. That's right. Yeah, because yeah, they're not generating new ideas. It don't make no sense. Yeah. yeah. That's the, how they the do point, it. Though. The point is to slow them down. So they have to read every comment that comes in. Okay. Well, I'm going to be 5,000 different people. I'm mad now. <laughs> You're the best, well, Lisa. You're the best. It, it, recruit okay. other people. Don't don't pretend to be other people. That'll get us all in trouble. I'll do that too, John. Don't tell anybody. I'm just <laughs> now playing. it's going to be published. <laughs> I'm just playing. I'll just write one. But I'll yeah. get everyone right. else to write one. Write <clears throat> one and share the information out. Okay. And be as concrete as possible. If you're concerned about, you know, one specific thing, write about that. Okay, if, yeah. If, if they say, I oppose it, they're going to say, okay, she opposes it. Next. Okay, yeah, I, I oppose it because the, you know, the health of the children, the cows, the crop, they're human beings that could suffer immensely over this for some money. Y'all need to rethink this real good here. Right, I'll write that a little nicer. That's so country talking. <laughs> and one one thing that we found last year with our public comment, um, which we're other people have picked up on, and we're all starting to share the information, is one way to possibly slow them down and require an answer is instead of just writing a letter, put questions. How will uh -huh. water withdrawals from the Florida and aquifer affect the local community's well supply? Question okay. mark. Then they have to answer it. Yes. That's so, something we learned when dealing with the Army Corps. I think it works the same with Georgia EPD. If you just say, but, this is my concern, they'll say, okay, you got a concern next. If you say... Uh, we need to know, they didn't say in the permit, so what's the answer? Then they have to actually address the question. Okay. So we could run. And each I'm going to go with the health of the people. And then, yeah, okay. I understand now. So you could write letters for each concern. The same person could write a letter of concern, not concern, but a question about 
different, different, different aspects of the thing. So one person could write several questions and that could sl help slow it down too, right? Yeah. I believe, I believe you <laughs> so can submit you, as, comment, as many comments as you want. Is that not right, Emily? I don't, I don't know that answer. Um, I think they would lump it all together if they saw the same name. But to Judith, to your point, if you're hosting a, um, uh, like what I've, I've seen at other river keepers, they host public comment parties and they say, these are our top five concerns. This group, you guys focus in on water quality uh, as it relates to, you know, human health. So they will have a team just sifting through that information and then they will generate five or however many are in the group's letters and then you have another one looking at something else, water withdrawals, and someone else is looking at, um, you know, air quality. River keepers probably are not going to be, at least St. Mary's River Keeper, I can't speak for Swanee. Um, we are not going to be commenting on the air quality because we're a water organization. I understand deposition and all that kind of stuff, but we're focusing our energy on the surface mining permit and the groundwater withdrawal permit. So those are the three surface, uh, surface mining, groundwater and air quality. So St. Mary's river keepers just focusing in on two of them that have to relate to the water. Um, and so when someone asks what do, I have this concern, what should I focus my letter on? Then I can direct them to a place and then someone else may do something else, another topic. So if you wanted to do a letter writing party, you can kind of spread the wealth out and you get more numbers of comments submitted by different okay. people. Well, does that does that okay. answer your question, Judith? Um, yeah, that partially answers the question. I I'm I don't do the rivers and stuff, but my children do, and I'm very concerned about you know our really about our world. My sister was very involved with the water wars at St. Petersburg, Pinellas County, and. And, he'll, you know, the drawdown of the well fields and stuff like that. And she went through so much trauma that we just all kind of backed off after. And she is recent. She died three years ago. But um, so I guess all of us are starting to uh, reach out again. <laughs> and there were so many things that she learned through that about what an individual citizen could do if you just hang in there um and and i have i have great concern about our aquifers and and just our whole surrounding the i don't know how to express it but it's sometimes it's just overwhelming and so uh, um i'm learning and i'm a healthcare professional too so i'm concerned oh your health poor brain you know, <laughs> you know, health wise and we have our all of our own concerns with you know like with, in dentistry they've disconnected the mouth from the rest of the body <laughs> and we're trying to get it reconnected so i work that way too so um we yeah, do what, we do what we can right we, yeah we um yeah so any river keeper is probably not going to say much about air quality either but uh individuals Please feel free if you're concerned about air quality, put something concrete in there, preferably with a question. Um, we did try doing air quality related to the Sable Trail pipeline, but it's always difficult if you're a water organization, but individuals don't have that problem. So look at that Azalea Festival. That that form we had is a good way to get more people. We got we gave that form to about five people and they wait they may mail it in. That's the one you're talking about. The, I'm not the sure form what we had that to. Uh, it uh, was for the um the mining, but we had the papers there so they could fill it out and send it in. Um not sure what you're referring to, so let's talk later. Okay. But, I've got a uh, question um, Emily, um, sometimes when you're doing um, sending in letters to politicians and so on, you need to be est established as a stakeholder. Is there any um, 
uh, is there any limit on who they're listening to in terms of whether you live in the watershed or in the county or so on? No, so the, the mining and public comment last year brought in uh, public comments from around the world. Um, so they do like to see the connection to the swamp. So just by stating something like, I'm a frequent visitor of the Okefenokee, I live downstream of the Okefenokee, um, you know, that kind of thing to make the connection um, is important, but um, it's not, they won't throw out the public comment if you are from a different county and in a different state. We're trying to get Florida uh, to engage in some capacity of this issue because it will impact a Florida waterway. Um, but up until this point, Florida has kind of turned a blind eye to it, um, saying it's not our waterway, it's not in our jurisdiction. Um, but from what I'm seeing is that there there is some interest now um, in understanding the impacts to, to Florida, especially from the aquifer uh, side of it. So no, there's no limitation, but if you wanna throw in there, like I live downstream from the Okefenokee on the Suwannee River and I frequent the Okefenokee, these are my concerns for my future experience of it, that kind of a thing. Great question, Thank Heather. You. And Heather, are you the one with the tree farm? Yes. So there are a lot of concerns have come up about you know the salt deposition and the aerosolization of the salts um, that have to do with surrounding tree farms. So I think your perspective as a tree farmer um, and a conservationist might be a good angle uh, to take. Yeah. Is there oh, um, is your tree farm? data on that, evidence, um, and, or a clearly laid out scientifically based uh, position on that? Uh, Dr. Red Jackson had a public comment last year about the evaporators. And then, of course, you have the um, water withdrawal from the ground. Um, and then there's historical. John may have some information about historical titanium dioxide mine reclamation issues. Um, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm still a little new. So um, what was that, I, that guy's name? Dr. Rhett Jackson, R-H-E-T-T. Jackson, right. he's the hydrologist from UGA. R okay. Remind me and I'll get it to you, Heather. Thank you. Uh, what, one thing that uh, we've brought up repeatedly and I'm trying to get more people from Florida to bring up is during Hurricane Irma, the only pollution spills in the Swanee River Basin in Florida were from titanium dioxide mines on Trail Ridge in Florida and they came from sites where Twin Pines was processing tailings. You know, it didn't actually happen directly during the, the storm, but afterwards they released wastewater from their containment ponds. So if they could do that in Florida, why should we trust them to keep the wastewater in in Georgia? Because you know, remember what Emily was saying about the river going up really quickly? Imagine the amount of rainfall causing that falling directly on these wastewater sites. How are they really going to contain it? Especially considering I received a tip from a miner who wished to remain anonymous that um, the nature of these soils on this particular site is they have far more of what are called technically slimes, S-L-I-M-E-S, -E yes, like slimy slimes, which are really fine particulates that when you dig those up and you try to build berms for wastewater ponds, the berms may easily slide and slip and cause leaks. And I don't think that's been adequately addressed. There's like a paragraph or so the last time I looked in the mining land use plan. Yeah, they did update their soil, their erosion and sedimentation plan. Uh, we brought that into our public comment last year as well, John, is concerns from mm -hmm. for the berm stability during heavy rain events, um, mm -hmm. especially since they go right up to the boundary line. Um, so there's no room for fail like failure um, and containment. And um, so they updated their sediment and erosion control protocol. Um, but that's that's all that's been said about it. 
Okay, and uh, Hamilton County, Florida passed a resolution opposing the mine and supporting the swamp. And okay, um, that's the fourth county downstream on the Swanee River where Clinch, Eccles, Hamilton. We're trying for some others. We don't like to say who they are until we actually get them or don't. So, um, you know, the, uh, Hamilton County, Florida is not directly adjoining the swamp. And it's certainly not on the St. Mary's River, but it is downstream on the Sawani River. And they're quite concerned. That's why they passed this. I must remember to try to get them to file that as an actual comment through the comment mechanism. Also, the other counties. So, you know, simply being downstream, if something happens to the Sawani, it's going to affect Hamilton County. And of course, the Florida aquifer, you know, they drink from the Florida aquifer and the surficial aquifer, just like all the rest of us. Yeah. My main concern is when it comes to mining, using the water there and bottling south in the springs, how long is it gonna be before the aquifer is infiltrated, infiltrated with salt water? Not only well, that, Sturgeon, is there a way that we can pause the progression of the mining until we actually finish finding out on the Sturgeon about their spawning rituals and how many are there? Well, these recent county resolutions recommend a, I believe, five-year moratorium on all mining. I don't know that we'll get that, but it could happen. Also, you may not be aware that, uh, well, you probably know, Sarah, you've seen it on our testing committee, but uh, only about a month ago, there was a wastewater spill from a mine upstream from the Santa Fe River in the Swanee River Basin. So, you know, it's still happening. Why should we expect it's not going to happen in Georgia on this site? And that wasn't by Twin Pines. That was by Camours, who should know better. What, did they did they ever complete their statement of that spill? It seemed to end end abruptly. No. Ah. We should probably query FDEP to see if we can get any more information out of it. And uh, well, Camours claims there was nothing harmful in the wastewater. How do we know that? Where's their test results? Do they have test results? Did FDEP require them to take water quality tests? They should have test results to even make that statement. They should. Do they? We should try to find out. In our copious spare time, maybe we can get some of our Santa Fe River people to help file the requests. Um, Sarah, to your point about the sturgeon, though, um, you are correct. They should be they should be waiting until results are found and you know they're they're still compiling they're still trying to get the rest of their data georgia epd is uh fish and wildlife service has conducted their survey but now they have a next step that they need to take so they're really in and then this doesn't even tell us uh when the sturgeon are in the river these are just trying to identify potential spawning grounds in the St. Mary's. So we don't even know when the sturgeon are in the river spawning. And so that takes genetic testing of water. And so that has to be done um, by a researcher. And that hasn't been done because you got to have funding to be able to run those tests. So yes, I mean, it, it should is... be completed before all of this is being decided. Yeah, not to mention that entire area is a wildlife corridor that goes all the way up and down the East Coast. Uh -huh. Yeah, and that's one of the big concerns about the um, the light and the noise is bird migrations. And so there has been a lot of, uh, so if, a, if, a, if birding is your thing, that might be something you might wanna comment on. They do address, they have a couple of documents to address those. Um, so if you want to reference what their documents say and what how they're trying to answer your questions, but if you're a birder and you're concerned of that birding corridor, uh, read the noise and the light documents and then comment on that. Could be an, uh, an avenue. We will not be doing that, of course, but um, y'all can. 
If you want to see all the documents, just Google for Georgia EPD Twin Pines. They have a web page that links to all of it. And you know, you can you can choose some subset. You don't have to read every single document. There's a lot of them. And uh, you can send to twin times dash comment at um and can't remember it off the top of my head, but if you do what I just said, it has the comment address, it's an email address. You don't have to do anything more than just send email to get it to them. Yeah, and I, I can tell you, EPD is as tired of all this as the rest of us. <laughs> Back when the Army Corps briefly took up um, oversight, it took EPD like less than a day to say, oh, we're just waiting for the Army Corps now. And they... <laughs> I do not think they were happy when they had to take it back up. But the, uh, it's uh, Twin Pines. I put it in the chat, John. Yeah. Good. Twinpines.com at dnr.ga.gov. The party line from EPD and from most of the Georgia legislators is we have a process. We're letting the process work its way out. Okay, that's fine as far as it goes. The process, however, is broken. Uh, there is a bill in the legislature. I haven't checked lately to see did this one go anywhere to uh, make it possible for EPD to examine the past history of applicants for permits, including in other states, and to reject the permits if they find bad actors. If that had been law, this never would have happened because of the track record of these people. Um, so that would be a good thing. It's pretty late. And it's also broken in the sense that multiple Georgia legislators have told me, well, you people haven't proved it will harm the swamp. That seems totally backwards to me. They should have to prove it won't harm the swamp. Now, the miners claim to have done that, but as Emily has pointed out, you know, many professional hydrologists and others don't believe they have. And there's little things like for their uh, water quality testing, supposedly they're going to do during the mining, They've picked very dubious places to do levels and testing, like in McClinney, Florida, way downstream, not at the obvious site at Moniac, for example. And uh, EPD is just backing them up. EPD has their own hydrologist who did a study months ago, and EPD's response to almost all comments of that sort is, we're sticking with what our hydrologist said. So... What Emily didn't say, and maybe doesn't want to say, so I'll say it, and I'm not saying she agrees with this, is the comment period ends, I believe, on April 9th. That's a 60-day comment period. Now, after that, the Environmental Protection Division has to continue working through all the comments. They have to at least read every one, and if there's questions, so far as we know, they have to answer the questions. Now, the answer may be nothing more. Our, hydro our hydrologist already said, but they got to do something. The next step after that is they're very likely going to issue the permits. The next oh. step after that is lawsuits will start flying. So any Riverkeeper at this point does not intend to sue, but certain other organizations whom you may have heard of during this talk probably will. I won't name any names. Yes, whoever you all do is, sue them. You can't have this. Yeah, I mean... Yeah. We don't have as much standing as some other bodies because it's not in our watersheds. And for standing, it really helps if it's in your watershed and especially if you have members who are directly affected. It's much harder for us to say that. While 85% of the Okefenokee Swamp is in the Swanee River Basin, nobody lives in the Okefenokee Swamp. We have no members there.
And we have members, of course, downstream, for example, in Hamilton County, Florida, but that's more difficult to use as a basis than if you have members and, you know, if it's in your watershed. So, yeah, I love that Okefenokee. Took my yeah. kids up there all the time growing up. Mm -hmm. Now, it does help that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has weighed in saying that they are asserting federal water rights for waters that flow into the swamp. If nothing else, that should be very interesting to include in any lawsuit. And I sure hope Fish and Wildlife Service sues the, sues the state and the miners. I don't know. I'm just guessing they might. So please do keep sending in your comments. Um, they may not stop the permits, but any comments are then public record and can be used in lawsuits. And they have to answer the questions by April 9th, you said? April 9th is when the comment period ends, then they will continue working through addressing the comments. Oh, okay. We don't know how long that can take for the previous comment period. It took, uh, what was it, nine months, I think? Yeah, and they uh, had 75,000 comments come in. Right. Ooh. Which has got to be the most for any mine ever in the state of Georgia, possibly for any permit at all, any kind. Yeah. And while... Nothing's going to happen in the state legislature this year. Next year, perhaps something will, and all of these comments will help influence that as well. Yeah. And continue trying to get resolutions. Um, right. Uh, I'd like to thank Randy Kennedy, who helped get two of them, Barron County and Nashville, Georgia, and is working on more. Because... Um, state legislatures definitely pay attention when they see resolutions from counties and cities. And by the way, the Georgia Municipal Association also supported HB 71. That's the so-called Okefenokee Protection Act, actually the Trail Ridge Protection Act. So that's significant. So keep up the pressure. It may not stop the permits. But it could be useful. Any comment could be useful in a lawsuit, and every comment helps the possibility of getting better legislation next year, which at the very least could stop further mines. And given that, as you've heard Emily say several times, this these permits are for a demonstration mine. If they get their foot in the door, or their camel's nose under the tent, whatever you like then they're almost certainly gonna come back and say, well, that's a precedent. Now we should continue mining the rest of our property. And even worse, directly north of their property is a much larger tract by, owned by somebody who's repeatedly said he'd just love to mine it. So if they get their foot in the door, it could expand rapidly, but potentially- Where's that, Fargo? Excuse me? In Fargo? No. And we're talking north of the mine site. It's going closer to folks then. Oh, okay. Over on the Fargo side, this is something that will be in our comments. Many of you are aware of the humongous phosphate mine in Hamilton County, Florida. That's uh, The miners say they're going to close that in less than 10 years. They do not say they want to stop mining. The same deposits and, con and continue east across the Swanee River into Columbia County. One of our members has been warning about that for like five years. The same deposits also continue north across the state line into Lowndes, Lanier, and Eccles County, Georgia. There was a study in the 1960s which did test wells, and two of the most promising test wells were next to the Suwannee River, right next to Fargo and slightly downstream. Now, back then, they said this is not economically feasible, but mining methods have changed greatly since then. What wasn't economically feasible then could be now. This is why we, we recommend protecting the whole swamp, not just Trail Ridge, because I, for one, don't want to see 
phosphate mining next to the Samani River in Eccles County or Clinch County, Georgia. No. Okay, I'm talking too much. This is Emily's webinar. <laughs> I'm learning a lot about the other side of the swamp. This is fascinating. Yeah, that, that stuff about the phosphate deposits, uh, certain people on a committee that you're familiar with just don't want to hear it. But, you know, we're sending it in again. We've mentioned it before. And we do mention it to state legislators. And we'll see if we ever get any traction with it. And as you know, we recommend a 15 mile limit around the swamp because that would include the Swanee River all the way to the state line and the St. Mary's River all, all the way down around the loop until it turns east, east of Fargo going to the, to the Atlantic. So I don't see any reason to just protect Trail Ridge when the problem extends well beyond that. All right. Well, I'd like to say this has been very informative, Emily, and I much appreciate you doing this because, you know, your your watersheds are ground zero for this stupid mine. And I hope one way or another we can stop this thing. Uh, for all I know, the fish and wildlife crimp may make it hang fire for so long they give up. Or if we get legislation next year, they probably won't have started by then. Maybe that could make it unattractive because they can't expand. Or there's yet another thing going on I'm not supposed to talk about <clears throat> that might stop them. So there's ways, and every comment any of you send in helps this. Every time you get another county or city resolution passed, that helps. Every time you talk to your state legislatures and say you're opposed to it and why, that helps. So keep the pressure up. And thanks again to Emily Floor, the St. Mary's Riverkeeper, for leading the charge. Well, thank you, John, for this opportunity. And thanks, y'all, for your engagement on the west side of the swamp on this. We really appreciate it. Thank you.